uh, this VPG is uh, in, I'm not sure. One, one, one Dr. Dave is also there. Can all of you introduce? Meanwhile, sir is trying to connect. Uh, Divya is from KEM, so I know her. Uh, Ashwin, you are from? Hey, Anurag, by my student. Sure, sir. Ashwin, you are, you, uh, you are not audible, Ashwin. No, you're not audible. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shubhankar, yeah, Nitin is our has joined. Yeah. Uh, Prasad, I know. Uh, I'm an audition. Yeah, we are live now. Uh, we shall start. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining to the ESI case capsule. The first of its kind where the ESI is trying to have a common platform of teaching for every student across the board. <laughs> And uh, it will be a series on a monthly basis. And uh, we hope that we will live up to our expectations. Thanks to Professor Anurag for taking the time out and doing. And uh, thanks to Professor Nisha and Professor Nitin for taking a lot of time in organizing this, getting into the students, getting their feedback, all those things. And uh, I Welcome, Professor Jebar, President of Endocrine Society of India for this, the start one. And uh, after listening to opening remarks of Professor Jebar, then we will move to the case presentation. So over to you, sir. Okay. Warm good evening to my friends, Dr. Haribai, Dr. Nisha, Dr. Nitin, today's teacher, Dr. Anurag, my good friend. Students, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely happy to address this important, I would say, ceremony function today. Because Endocrine Society of India is very actively involved in academics, education, research, public awareness, lot, lot, lot of activities. I think this is one of the new idea recently started by Endocrine Society of India. I hope you know this will be very, very useful for all teaching faculties, students, practicing physicians, and all the fellows working in the Department of Endocrinology. There is no doubt about that. My era, I still remember when I was in Mumbai, the resources were very, very poor, in fact. When I got a Thesis topic by my teacher, Dr. P.S.M. Manon. Madam told me, okay, go to library and uh, look for references. Very easily, Madam told me, but in a, I thought it was very easy to do that. But uh, when I looked into the referral books, it was extremely difficult to locate the references. And uh, it was a hell of a time for me to find out all the references also. Now we have everything with us, good technology is there, the good, the journals are there, very easy to conduct research activities. Of course, our students and all faculties are actively utilizing all those things. Now regarding our academic activities, all institutions are very, very actively doing their academics. But in a, probably if you go for other institutions today, also I got a lot of information from all the sort of medical sciences because the spectrum of cases definitely varies. There is no doubt about that. So if you have combined educational or academic activities, we can learn a lot. For me personally, I feel that you know, this is a very good forum to learn endocrinology again and again, again and again. Especially our faculty members, I, I am damn sure my team, Haribai, Nisha, Nitin, they are arranging, they are preparing a beautiful academic agenda for our students. I am damn sure, I am very sure our students and practicing faculties will get benefited out of that. With this small introduction, I conclude and officially may I declare this program is inaugurated. Okay, 
And especially I thank my dear friend, Dr. Hari for coordinating all these activities. In addition, Dr. Nisha, even though she's very busy, Dr. Nidin is also very, very, very busy at CMC Velour and is finding time for all these academic activities. From my bottom of heart, I congratulate and thank my dear friends, Dr. Nisha, Dr. Nitin, Dr. Haribai, and all other members in our executive committee also. Let me conclude. Thank you very much. The, 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 this program is inaugurated. Over to organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the encouraging words. Uh, without wasting much time, I request uh, Professor Nisha and Professor Nitin to conduct the proceedings further. Thank you. Thank you, Jabbar, sir, and thank you, Dr. Hari, for the opportunity. I uh, will straight away go on to our first case capsule. Um, uh, let me invite Dr. Anida, Professor of Endocrinology, KM Hospital, Mumbai, uh, to take over the proceedings. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nisha, ma'am, and all seniors. Uh, Divya will be presenting the case. We have uh, uh, four, five to six colleagues uh, who will be part in discussion. So it will be mainly a discussion-based uh, thing. Uh, Divya, you can start with your case, please. Yes, sir. Are my slides visible, sir? Yes, it is visible. Yes, sir. Uh, so the index patient is a uh, 16 years and three month old male resident of Kurla, Mumbai. He presented with the com chief complaints of small sized penis and testicles and absent secondary sexual characters. History of presenting illness. Patient was third born out of a third degree consanguineous marriage. The birth history, he was a full it was a full term normal vaginal delivery with a birth weight of three kgs. There was no history of cryptorchidism or micropenis at birth. However, parents give history suggestive of retractile testes since birth. On inquiry, he gives history of hyposmia. There's no axillary hair or pubic hair. There's no history suggestive of any chronic systemic illness. There's no history of any midline defects or syndromic features. There's no history of head trauma or seizures. There's no history of testicular trauma or any drug abuse. So, uh... Uh, the where, yes, no history of pubic hair and axillary hair. Yes. Whether the presence of pubic hair or axillary hair helps you somehow? Uh, sir. Pin uh, down the diagnosis or it is just an ancillary thing you have asked or it is yes. customary to ask this? No, sir. Uh, the onset of puberty, it is marked in boys by the activation of HPG axis. Clinically, it is by the testicular enlargement. Pubic hair is not under the activation of the HPG axis, so it may not uh, uh, tell us about the onset of puberty. However, in CDGP, uh, pubic hair, pubic is also delayed. So that's why the history was asked. The patient is 16 years and three months. This history of absence of pubic hair and axillary hair is more in favor of CGDP in this case? No, sir. It can be... It is favorable of hypo, uh, hypogonad, uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism more in this case. No, I'm just asking about this. If this history of hyposmia was not there. Yes, sir. History of absent pubic hair and axillary hair, where will you put your case? So, going by the commonality, CDGP is the most common cause of delivery. Now, we are so beyond commonality, yes, sir. beyond sense of smell. Yes, sir. If someone has delayed adrenarche, which is, will, will favor a hypo hypo or a CGDP? CGDP. Yes, so CGDP will have a delay in adrenarche. Yes, sir. That may be uh, in that case. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Others can also answer. Are they uh, other students? Or in the panel, uh, uh, Prasad, uh, Ashwin, yes, uh, uh, can you join the group? Should we make it a discussion base, or it should be one to one? One to no, one. You can you can ask others also. You can ask others also. You can ask others also. 
places. So I think it's becoming a little chaotic, the voice thing when I think multiple people are joining. Ashwin, you're there? Uh, Ashwin? Sir, Ashwin, I think your connectivity is a little Hello, poor. Sir. Ashwin, I think your connectivity is a little poor, so there is a, a concern. Uh, Prasad, you are around? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will, I will, also, I will also go uh, pubic hair. Uh, we will help in degenerating between CDGP. Uh, Let me discuss, Prasad. My question is: So, whenever it comes to a hypogonadism, why is it male case comes again? In this case, what the way I have chosen is a male patient. Yes. So, what is so special about hypogonadism? Uh, so, most endocrine conditions are female. Uh, the prevalence is more common in women. So, why is hypogonadism more common in males? Divya, is it a case of a boy? Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, any comments on that, Prasad? No, sir. Sorry? No, sir. Uh, anyone else wants to take that? So, the question is, when we talk about precocity, it is more common in girls. And when we talk about hypogonadism, in general, it is more common in uh, males. So why is it so? Dr. Shubhankar, do you want to take the answer? I think males are brought to the medical attention. The female cases are maybe missed. Uh, how why will they be missed? They will be equally worried about like Turner women come to us for hypogonadism. So, so basically, uh, when it comes to early puberty, we see more often in girls. And when it comes to delayed puberty, so is CGDP more common in girls or boys? Boys. Boys. Is early puberty uh, more common in girls or boys? Girls. Girls. So why so distinction? Why the girls have early more often presence with early puberty and boy presence with delayed puberty? Girls, it is the FSH predominant uh, uh, pubertal process. So they, they present early with the breast development and all. But in the yes. boys, for the puberty, LH axis has to kick in. Okay. So. So this is uh, the reason because it is an FSH and the estrogen axis which is more, which decides the pubertal development of thalark, whereas it is the, which is the first sign of puberty in a boy. Testicular enlargement. That is decided by FSH or LH. It's by FSH. Sir. The same. Sir. The thalark is decided by the FSH. FSH. And same is uh, the enlargement of the testes. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead in the case. Please think about it. Yeah. The family history, the third degree consanguineous marriage. There was a significant so family about, history. Uh, there were last slide. Can you go back one slide? Yes. So we asked about the chronic systemic illnesses. Yes. So what is the reason for that? Uh, so, chronic systemic illness can cause functional hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, suppressing the hypothalamus level. So, mm -hmm. disorders like uh, CKD, uh, anemia, celiac disease, they can have delayed puberty. Are they very obvious in most of the cases, those systemic illness, patient will give a history for them? Or which are the subtle disorders which may be missed and the first presentation may be hypogonadism? Celiac disease can be one such, sir. What else? 
similarly they present with short stature also sometimes in a short stature when you take a history so what are the subtle diseases which you like to rule out hypothyroidism systemic illness we are talking about hormonal okay you have been expert in that area Re renal tubular acidosis okay so acidosis is one thing or a celiac disease are the two conditions or a subtle ckd may present to us with short stature or delay in puberty for that matter and what is a common illness or a systemic illness which causes hypogonadism especially in girl child specific more common in girls anorexia nervosa it is very important when it comes to delay in puberty then yes. and you talk about midline defects what are you thinking about uh sir uh, uh, certain syndromes and uh, midline features uh, defects can like cleft lip cleft palate and skeletal abnormalities can be seen in some genetic disorders of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism sure 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 let's move ahead then uh so in the family history it was a third degree consanguineous marriage and there was significant family history of elder brother being affected with similar complaints of uh, poor development of secondary sexual characters and also hyposmia in the elder brother the second brother however is 18 year old is well virilized what kind of inheritance you are looking in this family yes sir so uh, sir uh, both the males are affected okay so uh, given the history of hyposmia x linked recessive inheritance would be considered so no no so you have given consanguinity and two siblings are affected yes sir so classical pedigree for a which form of ad autosomal recessive this is a ar pedigree yes sir so is the hypogonadism associated with genetics yes sir have hyposmia associated with ar related disorders Yes, sir. There are few genetic disorders like uh, genes, which uh, like uh, FGF R one, FGF eight. They can be autosomal oh, dominant, also an autosomal recessive. Autosom also. Mainly autosomal recessive, predominantly autosomal recessive disorders, which yes. are the variants. Proc R two, Proc two, GNRH. Am I audible, sir? But they'll be yes, hyposmic. Ah, uh, they'll be normosmic. G H R, G N R H R. So I am talking about. Don't go with the hyposmia. I am talking. This is a classical pedigree, which is an autosomal yes. recessive. Two siblings. Genarach, are Genarach. Genarach. There. So, which are the mutations which will be there? Not in this family. If you look only at the pedigree, and I am asking about that. Okay, sir. Genarach, Genarach, R, R, L, L, R. Tachykinin, Kispeptin, Kispeptin receptor, Tachykinin receptor. Okay, so all of them are normosmic. Normosmic. In this case, you have what? Sorry, sir. Have a hyposmia in both the siblings. Yes, sir. So, which is likely to be? So then, this is likely to be a. Ah. Uh, it can either be the autosomal recessive ones like uh, FGF R one, FGF eight, Proc R two, Proc two, CHD seven. Okay, and uh, it can also also be uh, X-linked recessive. Say. Okay, so it could be X-linked recessive disorder because only the males are affected. Yes, sir. no sister in the family. Uh, so okay, and so we don't know whether it is a uh, uh, Kalman category, AD category, or XLR category. That's what we we can make out from this. Yeah, right. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so uh, fine. So elder brother would have received treatment by now. That yeah. history is not there. Okay, so what we have got from a history, so it's a clear cut familial case. Hyposmia yes. is there. So we are dealing with a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And what syndrome you name it? What is the name of the syndrome? Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome. Can you spell Kalman? K A W L M A N N. It's double N, double N. Yes. So who was Kalman? What was his uh, expertise? Any idea? Anyone? Anyone from the group? Okay. 
so i think everyone has put it on mute so he was a psychiatrist who was looking at the pedigrees and he found families of schizophrenia and x linked hypogonadism that is the first description so calvin is all uh, so is calvin equal to cal1 gene what is the difference between cal1 gene and calvin syndrome Prasad, Ashwin, anyone can take it. Cal two is, sir. Cal one, Cal two, and Cal three is there. Okay. Cal one so, is. Sir. Kalman syndrome. What is the commonality between Kalman An syndrome? Anosmia. Persons of anosmia. any kalman syndrome anyone with anosmia any hypogonadism hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with anosmia is kalman syndrome other abnormalities like cleft lip cleft palate renal agenesis synkinesia is classically in kalman okay so kalman is a bigger basket and kalman is just one of the genes involved in that clinical syndrome Uh, Divya, we can move ahead. Yes, sir. And there was no other family history of uh, infertility or anosmia, hypospadia, other non-reproductive phenotype. So the summary of the history is a 16-year and three-month-old apparently healthy male, born out of a third-degree consanguineous marriage. It presented with small-sized genitalia and poor secondary sexual characters, with hypospadia and similar history in the elder brother. Just make it without hypospadia. What is your diagnosis? Just make a typo error in the summary. Yes. And make it without hypospadia. So, what is your first diagnosis then? CGDP is still a possibility, sir. CGDP CGDP is a possibility, or CGDP is still a possibility? Is it CGDP more familial than hypo hypo or hypo hypo are more familial? CGDP is more familial. So then a sixteen year old comes with small genitalia, without hypospadia, with a similar history in the elder brother. What comes as a common diagnosis? Seventy so percent is inheritance is for uh, uh, CGDP and Kalman the uh, the family history is only in ten percent. CDGP would be the possibilities, as possibility. Okay. CDGP positive family history. And he didn't had any adrenarchy, no pubarchy. Does that yes, help? Sir. Yes, sir. So in the not examination, the we, sorry. The stage so of the height of the examined him. Did not examined him. So by examination, how will you differentiate between CGDP and hypo hypo? How will it help? ट्यूबर्टी and chs you can call as permanent hypo hypo which may have reversal so both will be one is self limited and one is kind of a permanent thing so how does size will help you okay what is uh, what is the full term so now cgdp is known as self limited delayed puberty and it is also known as constitutional delay in growth and puberty so i'm giving you a clue which will help you to differentiate in this case whether it is hypo hypo or cgdp so when is the height of the patient sir the stature okay. how how will it change in cgdp they are usually like uh, short and the so, hypo hypos are usually tall but they can be short no, so they will be short na no? because the pubertal growth has not come yes sir they come at 16 years they may not be always tall yeah. so Yes. How much is the height SDS gap you will see in CGDP versus a hypo hypo? So minus two SDS in a CGDP and minus one SD in a hypo hypo, especially if they come at 
such a is yes as we were talking about testicular volume it may be if you talk about a very severe hypo hypo yes the testicular volume would be lesser in a hypo hypo but you have partial hypo hypos yes sir. the testicular volume can be a complete range and even it can be more than 4 cc in that regard yes sir so in the examination uh, so only height is one thing which can differentiate a cgdp from a hypo hypo from the history uh, a similar history in a elder brother what was his age so elder brother when he presented to us he was 18 years old so uh, so can you take the history in the elder brother and find out whether it could be cgdp or not usually cdgp by 18 years that's the they enter into the puberty but the elder brother had presented at 18 years of age with the uh, poor uh, secondary sexual character small size genitalia and hyposmia so i'm talking about hyposmia is very very black and white answer so it's a straight forward thing if the hyposmia is not there yes that is the situation of what we are considering now correct so why 18 years for cgdp why that cut off of 18 years is considered is that cut off being reduced now <coughs> okay so because by Okay, so we are dealing with a case of uh, a familial hypo hypo who have anosmia. You have red flag signs. We are dealing with hypo hypo. What investigations will you do now? Examination? Can you show your examination now? Yes. Yes. On the general physical examination, his height is just below the third centile. Uh, his arm span for a uh, is a one fifty four centimeter for a height of one forty eight centimeter. The upper segment lower segment ratio is point eight four. along with that he had a sandal gap with a short fifth metatarsal clinodactyly there was no synkinesia no cleft lip or cleft palate or any other skeletal abnormality so uh, does he has unicoid proportions so unicoidism uh, arm span is greater than 5 cm by the height okay in general yeah. so do we have a normative data for arm span and height So do you call this boy unicoid now? Then, as per the proportions. So do you define unicoidism by the arm span and height, or upper segment lower segment ratios? So unicoidism is by the difference between the arm span and the height, sir. Okay. So generally, it said that five centimeter, but when we try to define it in the normative range, we found seven centimeter in boys, but that would also vary with the age. so you can take this 6 cm towards unicoid size okay next on genital examination smr status reveal bilateral retractile testes of 1 cc with an spl of 5 cm p1 v1 and no axillary hair systemic go back so usually one of the differential diagnosis is hyper hypo so what is a hyper smr in those cases so in uh, cases of hyper hypo or klein filters the testes is usually is hyper hypo synonymous to klein filter no sir okay so if you have a vanishing testis syndrome in this case what would be the smr like some degree of virilization would be there sir p1 in a vanishing testis may be absence like anorchia can also be present in vanishing testing syndrome Okay. The testicular volume won't help, but the pub pubic hair status can be also clear. Pubic hair status. So, what will be the difference between anorchia, pubic hair status, and his pubic hair status? Sorry, sir, I didn't hear. So, in the in cases of vanishing testes, why yes. do you think the pubic hair will be there? So, because that uh, testes was working. Uh, all throughout the puberty and over towards the end or something it got vanished so the volume has gone down but uh, the patient was exposed to testosterone and hence virilized no so that you are talking about classical klein filter syndrome where there is a decline in the testosterone value 
or a deacceleration of puberty which is there but in a vanishing testis where the testis vanishes in the third trimester of antenatal life what will they be unicoid will they be long legged or will they be like a hypo hypo they will be unicoid sir and not long legged they will be unicoid and not long legged and the phenotype will be very similar to hypo 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 uh, but the lh will be high and there may yes. be small amount of residual ledic cell in those uh, newborn like test yes sir. and they may have a breast development under that high lh drive high lh drive yes sir. yeah do you commonly see b1 and hypo hypo or it should be b2 or b3 severe hypos they usually have b1 sir however partial hypos can have b2 okay 30 to 40% so, can have hypo hypo can have and ghost sorry 32 40% in hypo hypo can have gynecomastia so why should a hypo hypo have gynecomastia partial probably why should partial have gynecomastia because of Oh. Prasad, can you give the reason of uh, hypo uh, gynecomastia in a hypo hypo case? My uh, hypothesis hypo hypo should not have gynecomastia, and that's a routine scenario. Hypo hypo usually will not present with gynecomastia. Once we start them on treatment, they do get some breast development. Uh, can you refute my statement or justify it or agree to it or disagree to it? Usually, so some uh, if there is uh, test, uh, testosterone levels are uh, more than twenty, uh, you you don't usually develop a gynecomastia. But when you know, compared to each other, all testosterone levels will be lower because of conversion okay. of testosterone to sperm. So one thing is, we get into pubertal gynecomastia. If you are not entering puberty, why will you get gynecomastia? In partial. In partial, what happens? What is partial in partial? The FSH okay. axis is preserved. Okay. In partial hypo hypo. The LH axis is affected. Okay. So the FSH mediated E2, the ratio of the E2 and testosterone that is altered. So they can have uh, the testo is absent in both the cases. So where is the question of testo and estrogen ratio comes into picture? In severe and partial hypo hypo, what is the level of testo? What is the definition of hypogonadism? Testosterone less than 1 nanogram per ml is what you define yes, sir. as hypogonadism. Prasad, are you with us? Are you okay? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. So usually yes. hypo hypo gynecomastia is not the presenting complaints as against uh, vanishing testes or Kleinfelter. In a hyper hypo, they present with gynecomastia. So gynecomastia is very prominent and a presenting concern. In hypo hypo, usually it is less often, if at all, it will be there when there is some degree of testosterone being formed some partial LH action is there and then you may have a gynecomastia. Usually when we start treating them with testosterone or HMG and HCG, they will develop gynecomastia, which we have to take care of. So when you look at the numbers, yeah, you can say 30% of the hypo hypo may have gynecomastia, but the prominent gynecomastia presentation as gynecomastia, troublesome gynecomastia will be more common in hyper hypo. And since we have discussed about the unicoidism, is unicoidism specific for hypo hypo prasad? Uh, no, sir, even hyper hypo can have unicoidism. Which kind of hyper hypo will have unicoidism? Where the uh, arm strength is more than. Sorry? Kleinfelter syndrome can have. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Kleinfelter syndrome will not have arm span more than the height because of the long leggedness. Sorry. 
ियम so because of hypogonadism you are getting unicordism so because hyper hypo klein filter is a synonym because most common causes of hyper hypo is klein filter and in that case you will get long legged so these are the two differences which you can clinically make out when a person comes with uh, so degree of viralization will be higher in klein filter long leggedness will be there and a prominent uh, gynecomastia or a troublesome gynecomastia favors a hyper hypo so uh, other examinations you have looked at the nystagmus and other things they are all normal cns gait is normal sir no abnormal is it patient has ataxia what kind of genetics you will be looking into uh, sir pnpla pnpla 6 bosher new house sir they have garden homes do they have hyposmia no they are normal mix no which is the, which is the other gene associated with hyposmia socks 10 uh, which is x linked no sima 3 is nv okay so we'll move ahead uh, so the case summary uh, so 16 year and 3 month old apparently healthy male born out of a third degree consanguineous marriage she presented with small size genitalia and poor secondary sexual characters with hyposmia and similar history in elder brother on examination the patient was unicorn Uh, with an SMR status revealing bilateral retractile testes with P1 B1 status with clinodactyly short fifth metatarsal and sandal. Divya, you have not talked about the height TPS. Uh, so the patient was just below the third centile. So height SDS, how much away from the MPH? So still CGDP is a more common diagnosis. Hmm. You have not checked the sense of smell in the examination. Ah, uh, sir, so the the history was striking, sir. So we didn't proceed with uh, upset test. History was striking. We should not have done the examination then. Okay, move ahead. The investigations, sir. History is striking. Do we need the investigations? Okay, I'm coming. So, uh, so uh, routine CBC. Uh, there was no anemia. RFTs and LFTs were within normal limit. And uh, at the age of sixteen years and three months, the LH was zero. FSH was less than point two five. With a testosterone of less than zero point zero five, prolactin was normal. And an inhibin B was also documented to be on the lower side, five five gram per mg. Which of the one test is against CGDP in this list? Prasad, can you tell which one yes, single inib- test is against? Low inhibin B. Low inhibin B is against CGDP. CGDP can. And FSH less than two, so very low. Very and low LH FSH is also. And the testo less than zero point zero five. Does it? Favor CGDP. Mm. Can you differentiate based on the testosterone value? Be more than fifty. Sorry. It will be more than fifty. Um. Okay, so one test, if I have to ask, it is inhibin B because usually inhibin B will be intact in the cases of CGDP. So we are dealing with a. Uh, Uh, hypo hypo testicular volume is very low, and it is a severe form of hypo hypo. Correct? Yes, sir. Severe hypo. Okay, fine. Uh, you want to confirm with the genetics? Yes, sir. The uh, MRI pituitary was also done, sir, which was suggestive of bilateral of uh, olfactory bulb hypoplasia. And uh, mm-hmm. so the bone age of the patient was uh, delayed. To thirteen point eight years, chronological age of sixteen years and three months. The other syndromic features were looked into. The ultrasound KUB did not reveal any evidence of renal agenesis. It was normal. Of the examination, uh, the color vision was normal. 
pure tone audiometry was also done which was normal so if you do uh, a genetics and it is found to be an os1 what percentage of calmen will have an absent renal kidney or absent kidneys so we're looking at a jungle of hypo 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 with anosmia of that what percentage will be calvin and of what percentage of calvin will have renal agenesis yes so uh, the uh, overall worldwide it is fgfr1 which is the most common however in india in our cohort it is anos1 as the most common what of percentage of, of calvin will have anos1 14% okay 15% 20% and what percentage of calmen will have renal agenesis some studies have shown up to 20 to 40% sir not sure 20% percentage around 30% around sir yeah, so 20% of the calmen uh, 20% of the calmen syndrome will have cal1 and of those 20% may have renal agenesis yes. so uh, familial x linked hyposmic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism the genetics in the index patient revealed a pathogenic mutation in an os1 gene a splice site variant I think Dr. Anurag has dropped off. We'll just wait for him to join. But till then, for all of uh, those who've logged in, do stay on. We do have an interesting quiz towards the end. Uh, and for every month's ASI case capsule, there would be one prize that would be given, which would be a cash prize of ten thousand rupees. to the pg and it would be a simple quiz based on all the discussion that's happening so if you've been listening carefully i'm sure there is a high chance of winning and uh, it would be just 10 simple questions uh, that would be asked towards the end so maybe i'll try and call dr rag but uh, hold on uh, till the time he is able to join so till uh, dr anirudh uh, comes in i think uh, we will just discuss uh, so uh, this is a uh, calvin anos1 gene uh, yes. mutation so uh, which all uh, clinical features were present and which all were not present these are usually classical in this uh, anos1 gene <laughs> and the patient had hyposmia and subtle skeletal features like short fifth metatarsal clinodactyly There was no synkinesia in this patient, nor there was renal agenesis. Other features which were not there, which are usually part hearing of loss. Pardon? Hearing loss will be ah, maybe that is so. That is very important. Uh, hearing loss, uh, as an examination finding in all cases of hypo hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, you should um uh, look for yes. hearing uh, specifically for hearing. um some Your other 
Pardon? The patient did not give any hearing abnormalities oh. and a pure tone audiometry was documented to be normal. Oh, okay. So that is very important. Then uh, any other extra um, uh, gonadal features uh, which, you, which which can be there in announcement and which were not there, other rare manifestations? Dendral agenesis. Ah, dendral, dendral issues then? Cleft palate, high arch palate. Then uh, oculomotor abnormalities can be there. Cerebellar ataxia. Uh, cerebellar uh, problems can also be there. It's diagnosed cerebellar ataxia. Ah. So even the uh, elder brother. Uh, so but then uh, why why he is shocked? What is his MPS? What is M MPH? I just MPH is around one sixty centimeter, ma'am. His bone age is thirteen point eight years. His height is one forty eight centimeter, just below the third centile. It's probably mm -hmm. still growing. Mm -hmm. What is the height of the brother? Um, the brother uh, is now uh, treated, ma'am. Oh. So he has achieved the uh, target height, 162 centimeters. No, why was it tall? And not uh, at the presentation, ma'am. Oh. Not tall. Okay, so uh, in an ideal situation, uh, how how do you want to manage this case? Uh, sorry, Anita has joined. Yeah. Uh, plan that, please take or I just yes. bridge in the. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. How much time we have now? Uh, no, no, we no, we just discuss what are the classic features of anosmin yeah. one gene mutation which the patient had and which the patient didn't have other rare manifestations which the patients didn't have, since like hearing loss, cerebellar um, signs and all. Another 10 minutes should be okay, Dr. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Divya, how will you manage such a case? Uh, sir, uh, considering the severe hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which is genetically proven. Uh, yes. For better uh, uh, prospects of future spermatogenesis, uh, pre-treatment with gonadotropin uh, with the HMG for the first three months and document a testicular volume increase and an inhibin B and then later on add on the H, uh, HCG along mm -hmm. with the HMG. Okay. So, uh, and now uh, since it was a Kalman and uh, uh, the uh, the, 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 the mother says that her uh, younger sister and uh, her child is three month old and also had a retractile testis. So in the same family. Yes, sir. So their Mossy's son. Maternal. Uh, maternal uh, yes. Is having a same problem is a boy yes, and has come to add three months of age. Will you manage him differently or you will wait and watch? No, uh, since there's uh, the importance of mini puberty in them, since it is absent in such cases of IHH, it is we have to mimic the mini puberty and we have to not waste that window and start the treatment at that young age only with uh, gonadotropin, sir. Yeah. Pre treatment with HMG followed by HMG and HCG. So, uh, is there any role of testosterone in mini puberty, or it is mainly the FSH which is more important? And would you like to treat with only with FSH in mini puberty or both FSH and HMG? So, H uh, I mean, HCG. Yes. Uh, so, in mini puberty, it uh, First, initially, it is uh, we have to build up the testicular volume and the Sertoli cell reserve. So, pre-treatment with HMG, and then followed okay. by followed by uh, HMG and HCG. So they will have a micro penis or a small size phallus. So you will require an HCG or a testosterone treatment after the FSH. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, if this child says uh, that I want to be treated with only testosterone, how will you guide them? Yes, sir. So considering the severe phenotype uh, in this patient, the uh, 
one of the factors which is which govern the spermatogenesis potential is the baseline testicular volume but which is severely affected in them so pre treatment with testosterone might not have a, a better spermatogenesis uh, profile uh, as compared to this treatment with gonadotropins so we would advise the patient to treat, go ahead with gonadotropin therapy okay yes okay so that's that's your school of thought and if his testicular volume was 6 cc would your advice differ or it would have remained the same uh, so in that in that situation sir this pre treatment with hmg can be negated we can start up front with hmg and hcg or, or sometimes only testosterone or only testosterone in that case yes, maybe sir yes so and how if you have to give uh, testosterone how do you give it so initially we started 50 to 100 mg intramuscularly uh, monthly dose testosterone enantiate then increase the dose every uh, month by 50 mg and gradually over the span of one year reach the adult replacement dose over one year is it Certain not too fast over Two two years. So increment is usually every six months, na? Right? Yes. Sir. Since they may be a little, uh, they have come later. You may reduce that time span of three to four years to two years. Two uh, years. But one year will be too fast. Yes. What are the side effects you face when you give testosterone? Sir, because it is a monthly injection, there can be wide fluctuations in the serum testosterone levels. The patient can have some mood swings or. Uh, Psychiatric abnormalities, or the acne, or if it's a very high dose and priapism. Psychiatric abnormalities are very huge. Mood swings. Uh, okay. Mood swings. Acne. Okay. So with HCG treatment, do you uh, and if you get a gynecomastia on testosterone treatment, how will you treat it? So we decrease the dose or the decrease the dose of the testosterone, sir. We have to build up the dose. Maybe or maybe if you decrease the, the dose, the gynecomastia will further aggravate. The frequency of, uh, or maybe add on a uh, aromatase inhibitor. Okay, we can add an aromatase inhibitor or a tamoxifen in that oh. case. In case of uh, gynecomastia, which comes up. Yes. Okay, uh, you have something more. You have a follow up for the brother or anything. Uh, yes, sir. the brother of uh, elder brother was treated with HMG and HCG. Now he is well vitalized, and the semen is documented, sir. Spermatogenesis is there. So once, how long will you give HCG and HMG in such a case? For a year, sir. And then what? You will shift back to testosterone, or what will you do? So after a year, uh, we document a semen analysis, and then we can uh, shift over to testosterone. Okay. Is there a role of sperm banking in such a case? So really, whenever the fertility prospects are there, then we can restart them on HMG and HCG. That's one option. Yes. And sperm. in case after HMG and HCG, you can document a sperm and a sperm banking can be done, which may be useful in future. That's one another way of looking at it. And then you shift them to testosterone treatment. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, Nisha ma'am and uh, Nitin, uh, I think uh, we have discussed the case. Uh, we can uh, move to the quiz and the second part of the program. Uh, thank you, Vitness, uh, Dr. Anita, for that wonderful um, uh, session, and uh, Dr. Divya for the presenting that case. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin and Dr. Prasad for the active participation. Unfortunately, Dr. Shubhangar couldn't join because of some connectivity issues. Um, uh, but then it, uh, I'm sure it was a very useful uh, um, uh, case for their postgraduate students and uh, for all the practicing physicians. Uh, over to Dr. Nitin for the quiz. Sure. Uh, Divya, could I share my screen? Yeah. Great. So uh, just the quiz is only for postgraduate students, uh, endocrine trainees, DM or DNB irrespective of whichever year of training you belong to. Uh, this will be an online quiz. You just need to have a smart device in addition 
to the uh, device that you're using to watch the screen, be it on a Zoom platform or through the ESI website where you've registered. I can see that there are more than 100 people uh, logged in right now. Uh, there would be only one winner out of this quiz uh, who will get a cash prize of 10,000 rupees. And for that, it is very important that you mention your name correctly. And uh, hopefully you've registered with your right phone number and email address because that's what we would be using to uh, contact you as the winner. The quiz uh, would be on the platform of Menti, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, but nevertheless, I will go through the rules again. And uh, you should be able to join with the help of a barcode uh, that I would show. So I think you should be able to see my screen now. And uh, with this, uh, let me move on to the rules of the quiz and what is required. Uh, here is your smart device internet and the platform where you're watching this particular slide. Uh, the answer has to be correct, but it also has to be fast. So even if 10 people answer correctly, but the person who's answered fast would get the maximum points, each answer would carry a maximum points of a thousand uh, score per question. There, it is time bound. So if you miss out on the time that is allotted per uh, question, then you would miss out on the opportunity of answering that question. There's no negative marking. And uh, there is only one single answer for each and every question that you have. You'll be able to join with the help of a barcode that I'll show you in the next slide, or you could also go to the website of menti.com and just type in uh, the code that I will show. If you by any chance get logged out in the middle, you should be able to join back again with the help of entering the code, which will be shown on each and every slide. Uh, as we move along on the quiz. Very important that you enter your correct name when you are provided uh, the option to do so, which would be in the next to next slide. So I think with this, uh, we will start. And as you can see on the screen, you have uh, two options to log in. Either you use the QR code or you may go on to the website of menti.com and uh, you could enter the code. The code is 81495215. And as you can see, this is also mentioned uh, on top of the slide and will be mentioned on many of the slides that you will see in front. At this point, after you have joined, you should just be able to see a thumbs up. And I can already see that about uh, 15 or 16 people have uh, uh, clicked on the thumbs up and they are ready to score. So maybe I'll just give half a minute here before we move on to going on to the quiz. As soon as I click on the next slide, you will get the option of entering your name. So I see there are more than 45 students uh, who have already logged in. I'll wait for the score to go above 50. And then we can start. Okay, so it's stuck there. So I move on to the next slide. You should be able to type your name now. We have 118 participants so far, moving on to 125. So let's start with the first question. I repeat, you will see the question here. You'll see the question on your device, but you have to answer through your device only. Dash percentage of testosterone is bound to SHBG. Sex hormone binding globulin, you know that it is bound to different things, different kind of uh, globulin, albumin, some are tightly bound, some are weakly bound. The question is what proportion is bound to the sex hormone binding globulin? So the correct answer is 54 to 68%. Let's quickly look at this particular figure, which is directly taken from William's textbook. And uh, as you see that about 30 to 44% is tightly bound and it is with SHBG. 
The one which is free and albumin is together known as the bioavailable testosterone and uh, uh, would amount to about uh, 54 to 71%. Uh, so let's see who's been answering correctly and fast. Because a lot of people have answered correctly. We see that Pankti Parikh is currently leading, but there is a very close uh, competition that we can see. But nevertheless, uh, we have 10 questions, so anybody can gradually come up in the scoreboard, which is of top 10, but ultimately only the first prize would get uh, the cash award. Moving on to our second question. And the second question is about a normal semen analysis. We all see a, a report of semen analysis. Three of these are normal. One is abnormal. Very simple question. If you've seen a couple of uh, reports, but you have to answer correct and fast. So which of the following is incorrect? Excellent. So all of you have been seeing these reports and we know about the morphology, uh, only more than 4% of normal forms are actually required uh, for reporting on normal uh, seminal fluid analysis. Obviously this normal form is with uh, very strict criteria that is followed, but yes, the other parameters are also something that you have to know about. Glad that most of you have answered this correctly. Let's see how the scores have changed. And though a lot of people have answered correctly, it is important to also answer fast. And with this, Dr. Lakhan seems to have taken the lead uh, at this point with the second question. Let's move on to the third question. As I said, you have a total of 10 questions. All of the following conditions are associated with a reduced SHBG concentration, except, well, again, uh, something common in clinical practice where you have to interpret the total testosterone value with some caution. And one of these conditions is not associated with a decreased SHBG. So again, let's look at the table from Williams. Uh, now, what we see is there are several causes of decreased SHPG concentrations. Acromegaly is one of them, which most of you have answered wrongly. But uh, it's important to know that hepatic cirrhosis and hepatitis is associated with increased SHPG concentrations. So again, uh, this uh, question, not many people have answered correctly. So let's see how the scores change. Dr. Lakhan is still on uh, the leading role at the third question. Let's look at the next question. We are at the fourth question. All of the following causes of hypogonadism are secondary to loss of function mutation of GPCRs. All of them are autosomal recessive except one, and I think this was discussed during the case discussion that you listened to. Correct. So... This is another table from Williams textbook. And as you see that uh, the loss of function of GPCR causes uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, but GNRA, GPR54, and FSH are all autosomal recessive. Some of the prokinectin receptor 2 are uh, definitely 
uh, autosomal dominant with incomplete penetration. So that was the question. So all of you might be getting an idea that reading tables of Williams is important for the quiz, but that's not the case. There are questions from the text as well. Let's move on to the fifth question. All are causes of high HCG except. Now, sometimes it could be assay interference, menopause, germ cell tumors, or none of the above. Right, so the 52 people who've answered menopause as the answer, I thought, uh, yes, uh, that would be uh, the trap in that question. But uh, what we should know is that uh, HCG le uh, levels up to 14 million international units per litre uh, uh, could happen in menopause and uh, the explanation that you can see on the screen. So yes, uh, menopause can be associated with elevated HCG and you don't unnecessarily investigate such patients. So each question is important. And so we see that now the top position is taken by Dr. Nanda. We are through half the quiz at this point. We move on to the sixth question. And we talk of the Traverse trial for testosterone replacement. And it resulted in higher incidence of all of the following except one. Right, so atrial fibrillation, kidney injury, and pulmonary embolism was seen more with testosterone and not the MACE outcomes. So, yes. Uh, that was the correct answer here. As I said before, every question is important. So it is changing the scores. And we have Dr. Lakshman Kumar, who is currently leading at the sixth question. Moving on to the seventh question, the last four questions that you have. The winner will take away 10,000 rupees of cash price from the Endocrine Society of India. And the question here is on Sertoli cell only syndrome. All of the following are correct except. Brilliant, all of you, most of you have answered that correctly and that's correct because it is uh, only the FSH, the testosterone levels and the LH levels are actually normal here and therefore that was the right option. Right, so Dr. Nanda has taken his position back. A tough competition happening here. <laughs> Moving on to the third last question today. We're talking of osteoporosis management with male hypogonadism in the elderly. The treatment of choice would be testosterone, bisphosphonate, sildenafil, or dihydrotestosterone. We're talking of elderly people with hypogonadism. So if it was young, yes, testosterone would have been the right answer. But in elderly, it is uh, definitely bisphosphonates and it's not testosterone. It is not shown uh, to be effective. So moving on to the last two questions of the day. We keep saying the winners are changing. So best of luck to everyone for the last two questions. Dr. A, we don't know who you are, but... Uh, I hope you will be able to identify yourself if you win ultimately. Let's look at the second last question.
We're talking of hypogonadism in patients who present with morbid obesity and all of the following are mechanisms except one of them. So you can see the options much bigger on your phone. Right, so yes, it is uh, not testicular dysfunction, which is often associated here. And uh, most of them are because of the other three causes that were mentioned. So friends, with this, we move on to the last question, which would be the defining factor for the winner for today. And before that, let's see who is actually sitting on the top position. It is still Dr. Ray and we really don't know uh, who you are. And if you're not able to find out who you are because you've not mentioned your name correctly, we might have to go with the second prize. So next time for the next case capsule, please ensure that you've mentioned your name correctly. Right, so we move on to the last question. And this question will define who is the winner for today. And all of the following drugs are associated with gynecomastia, except one of them. Miprazol, tricyclic antidepressants, phenytoin, leviteracetam. All of you got it right. It was a relatively simple question. Again, this is a snapshot from Williams. Uh, you see all of the other three drugs are mentioned here. And with this, let's see who is the winner for the quiz of the first case capsule that we had. And I think it is still Dr. A. We will try and find out who you are, but if not, then it would be Jagat Pati Babu. And uh, for next time, please mention your names correctly. Congratulations to Dr. A who's won the quiz. And I think uh, with this, uh, uh, we come to an end for this session. I request uh, Dr. Hari Kumar, sir, to uh, say the concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Nitin and Dr. Nisha for the excellent conduct of the quiz as well. It was more, uh, I would say, entertaining and then engrossing. And uh, thanks to Dr. Anurag and Dr. Divya for conducting and comparing and discussing most of the relevant aspects, including the genetic aspects of hypo, -hypo. I am sure some of the other student participants, we would be having more active interaction in the next edition. We had partial interaction, I would say, this time. Not complete one, but uh, nevertheless, we will be having involving more of them in the future. And... Uh, as what Dr. Nidhin has said, if I am able to find A, I will shell out 10,000. Otherwise, that stays with me or to the participant number two. Thank you uh, all for the... Yeah, please. So one Somebody point. Else. So I found out who is A and that person has just passed out. So won't be eligible for getting the prize. So it, it will be the second person. Perfect. So, and I will send the name details. Yes. Sir. Perfect. So basically, the it is idea is learning. Nevertheless, it is also fun. It is to encourage the students to participate. There is no problem. We will be having more such activities in future. Thank you all for the active participation and thanks to Dr. Nisha and Dr. Nitin for their time out and uh, doing such a wonderful activity for the benefit of students. Have a great week and we hope to see you with more number and more active participation in the next edition. We shall be sending out the topic very soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good night.